The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. In green pastures he makes me lie down. He restores my soul and leads me. singing to the Lord was truly a time of worship for you and blessed your heart, preparing you for the hearing of God's word. And so <clears throat> we are going to start our a second part of this sermon series on serving the Lord. 
And I want to ask you a question this morning as we're gathering and as, as we prepare to get into the Scriptures. I want to ask you a question. Are you happy today? Are you truly happy? Many people in the world, maybe, or maybe here today, are not really happy. You, you, you put the face on. And we're good at that, aren't we? We can put the face on and act as though we are happy people, but deep down inside, if we're honest, we're not really happy. But do you know what will truly make us happy? What will truly make us happy? They say that if a person knows why they exist, what their purpose is in life, if you know why your heart is beating, why are you even here, if you have purpose in life, you are truly a happy person. It's one of the most important things that an individual can know is why they exist and why they are living and to, and to begin to fulfill that purpose for their life. And as you sit here this morning, if you don't know why you exist, what is your purpose in life? You're not really happy. You're not really happy. But I believe that true happiness can be given to anyone. True happiness can, given, can be given to anyone because it comes from God. God gives us happiness, but that happiness only comes through a personal relationship with God. A personal relationship with God, and that personal relationship can only come through the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because Jesus hung on a cross for six long hours and took the punishment that you and I deserve for our sins, we can have a relationship with God. Jesus said he came into this world, and his purpose for coming was to give us abundant life. And you know what abundant life is? A good definition of abundant life is a life worth living. A life worth living. And so if you've turned from your sins, if you turn from whatever you're trusting in to get to heaven, if you turned from whatever sin is separating you from God, and you've placed your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, and He is your Lord, He is your Savior, you are on the pathway of true ha happiness. You see, knowing Jesus is just the beginning. It's just the start of your Christian life. I want you to listen to the words of the Lord Jesus Christ this morning and let Him define for us what happiness is. And so if you have your Bible, John chapter 13, I invite you to turn to it. John chapter 13. And I'll be reading verses 1 through 17. And then I'll pray and ask the Lord to bless His Word to our lives today. John chapter 13, it says, Now before the feast of the Passover, Passover, when Jesus knew that His hour had come, that He should depart from this world to the Father, having loved His own who were in the world, He loved them to the end. And supper, and end, supper being ended, the, the devil, having already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going to God, rose from supper, laid aside his garments, took a towel, and girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. Then he came to Simon Peter. And Peter said to him, Lord, are you washing my feet? Jesus answered and said to him, What I am doing you do not understand now, but you will know after this. In verse 8, Peter said to him, you shall never wash my feet. And Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no part with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. I'm all in. Jesus said to him, He who is bathed, taking a bath, needs only to wash his feet but is completely clean, and you are clean, but not all of you, for he knew who would betray him. Therefore, he said, you are not all clean. He's speaking of Judas Iscariot. So when he had washed their feet 
taken his garments and sat down. Listen, he said to them, do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you say, well, for so I am. If I, then your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Most assuredly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who is sent greater than he who sent him. Now, here's the last verse. If you know these things, blessed are you who do them. That word blessed, you can just replace it with the word happy. If you know these things, blessed are you, happy are you if you do them. Father, I pray that you bless your word to our lives today, that you would truly minister to our hearts, that we would hear your voice. Give us ears to hear, eyes to see, and a heart to understand the truth of thy word, I pray in Jesus' precious name. That's a wonderful, powerful statement. If you know these things, we have a lot of knowledge, do we not? We have a lot of knowledge, and that's good. But if you know these things, that's great. But happy or blessed are you if you not just know them, but what? Do them. Do them. And so Jesus gave us an example of what true service to his Father, to God, is. He humbled himself and got down on his knees and he washed his disciples' feet as an example of humility, as an example of service, of how he wants us to serve God Almighty, that we need to humble ourselves and serve each other. It doesn't necessarily have to be washing feet. I don't think any of us would have a problem washing people's feet. We would have a problem if someone tried to wash our feet. Am I the only one with that? Yeah, I think so. I've always felt that way. I probably feel the same way. And so this is a powerful statement. So as we're going through the spiritual disciplines that we're looking at, today is the second time I want to look at this idea of serving the Lord, the discipline of serving. So Jesus says, if you know these things, happy are you if you do them. So, what I get out of that is this, serving like Jesus, are you tracking with me? Serving like Jesus will bring you the most fullest life. Serving like Jesus will make you the happiest person in the world. Blessed are you, my child of God. Blessed are you if you do these things. And so, we need to be disciplined the goal of all of our discipline, if it's Bible intake, if it's prayer, if it's worship, whatever discipline we want to get into that we've, we've already covered, all of them, the goal of all of those is to become like who? To become like Christ. That is the goal of all of them. So to serve the Lord is to be like Christ. You and I will never, we will never be more like Jesus than when we discipline ourselves to serve the Lord. You'll never be more like Jesus, never, than when you discipline yourself to serve the Lord. Jesus himself says in Mark chapter 10, verse 45, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Did you hear that? Jesus said, I didn't come for you to serve me. I've come to serve you. And I've given my life as a ransom. So Jesus is saying that he did not come just to forgive us of our sins. But he came to make us holy. He came to make us like himself. That's the goal of our salvation. He did not live and die just so that we would be forgiven of our sins and then just left unchanged. He came and he died and he did all of that and he gave us forgiveness of our sins so that we would be changed. The plan of God, the plan of God for every believer is God is predestined before the foundation of the world is for his people to be conformed to the image of God's dear son. Romans 8, 29. And how does Jesus characterize himself? Jesus characterizes himself as one who serves. Jesus is a servant. And so again, 
You and I, you and I are never more like Jesus than when we discipline ourselves to serve the Lord. I think every Christian ought to desire to serve the Lord. I believe it ought to be the heartbeat, the passion of your life, because we want to be like Jesus, do we not? Jesus expects us to serve him. In fact, the very reason that Christ saved us is so that we would serve him. It's the very goal of our salvation is that we would serve the Lord. Let me give you a scripture that truly supports this. In Romans chapter 12, verse 1, Paul writes for us, I beseech you, I beg of you, child of God, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, I'm begging you by the mercies of God. Now, it doesn't tell us right there in that verse what he means by the mercies of God. You would have to know your Bible a little bit to have read verses prior to that. So that's chapter 12, right? So before chapter 12 comes chapter 11 and 10, and we go all the way back, right? And what that is presenting for us, the mercies of God, is everything that Paul has written from chapter 1 all the way to chapter 11. And it's simple. I'll, I'll just give you a simple conclusion of what it is. It's regarding your salvation, the whole book of Romans begins by declaring all people are sinners. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God and that we deserve to be judged by God. But God in His great love and His love for you and I, He sent His Son to die for our sins. He died, but when we trust the Lord Jesus Christ, a wonderful thing takes place. God declares that we're innocent. We're no longer guilty. It's called justification. And so these wonderful truths that He mentions in Romans chapter 1 all the way to chapter 11 regarding our salvation, that we've been justified, that we've been, that we've been sanctified, one day we'll be glorified. All of these wonderful truths regarding our salvation. Now, I want you to think about that for a moment. Everything God has done for you and I is an act of mercy. In other words, no one, no one deserves God's forgiveness. No one deserves God's love. No one deserves anything from God because if we're honest, we're sinners and we deserve judgment. But according to the mercies of God, everything that God has done for you, what does it say to do? That you present your bodies, you present your life a living sacrifice. God doesn't want you just to die for Him and just lay your dead body at an altar. He wants you to live for Him. Present your bodies a living sacrifice. Live your life for the Lord. Now, look what it says there, the last phrase. The last phrase of that verse says, which is your reasonable service. It's a reasonable thing. All that God has done for you and all that God has done for me, it is a reasonable service to worship the Lord with your life by serving the Lord. Robert Mounts, in his commentary, says, In view of God's acts of mercy, it is entirely fitting that we commit ourselves without reservation to Him. It is entirely fitting. In view of God's acts of mercy toward you and toward me, and, when, and if we're not getting this, if we're not understanding God's mercy, God's grace toward us, we don't know how bad we really were. We don't really truly understand how sinful sin is in our lives and what it costs God to send His Son to hang on a cross for six long hours. We're not getting it. So in view of God's acts of mercy, it's entirely fitting for us to commit ourselves to Him without reservation. He goes on to say this. Some Christians teach that accepting the free gift of God's mercy, of God's grace, does not necessarily involve a moral obligation on our part. You know, there's no obligation. We just can live the way we want to. He says that that is, a, that is heresy of a gi gigantic proportion. It is heretical teaching to think that you can get a free ticket to heaven and you don't have to serve the Lord. It's the, it's the opposite of why God saved you. And then he says this, uh, the popular cliche, listen to this, he is Lord of all, or He is not Lord at all, is absolutely true. Let me explain that. If you claim that Jesus is your Lord, but He's really not your Lord and Master, that you're not living for Him and serving, then He's not Lord at all. It's just words that we're saying to the Lord 
they're not real. So if he is Lord, then he truly is Lord of your life, and you're serving him. Now, I think most of us here today know everything I've just said. And you probably would agree with me. You're nodding your heads and saying, amen, Pastor. And you believe this is the purpose for your life, and I, I believe you probably desire to do it. But let me just ask you a simple question. Are you doing it? Are you serving the Lord? Are you disciplining yourself to look at your calendar, look at the clock, look at your things that you're doing in your life, and are you purposely setting, away, setting time aside to serve the Lord? And if you're not doing that, I know you're not happy, number one, and I know you're not fulfilling God's purpose for your life because we're all saved for the purpose of, say, of serving the Lord. And that is why we need to discipline ourselves. We need to discipline ourselves toward godliness by serving the Lord. And again, discipline is making ourselves do something that we don't naturally want to do. But it's also repeating. It's repeating the practice of something that we know will make us more like the person that we're focusing on. And if we want to be like Jesus, we need to focus on Him, on His life, on what He did. And as we focus on Him and put to practice the way He lived His life, we will become like the Lord Jesus Christ. And so today we're going to discuss motivations that we need to have in order to even want to discipline ourselves. What motivates us to even want to discipline our life so that we would serve the Lord? Now, I mentioned last Sunday that there are fleshly, sinful things that we can do to motivate our life to serve. Some of those fleshly things could be like the Pharisees who would ring a big bell, gong, 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 and get everyone's attention and they would drop some coins, right, into, into the, uh, or give some kind of charity, he says in Matthew chapter 6. And why did they do that? So that they would get everyone's attention, that people would know what they were doing. And so that's the wrong kind of motivation to serve, to even give. Jesus says, you don't want to do that. You want to serve the Lord who sees in secret. You don't let your right hand know what your left hand is doing. And you do it so your father in secret sees what you're doing because it's all from your heart. The other way is a self-righteous kind of service that you want to get that pat on the back. You want to get noticed. You want to be praised by people because it builds you up. That's the wrong kind of motivation to serve the Lord. The other kind of motivation, I didn't mention last Sunday, but as I was thinking about this, some people serve the Lord because they think it's going to have, it's going to make some kind of impact on God, that God's going to see what they're doing and say, whoo, I see what you're doing, and I am going to take, let me see, 50 of the sins that you've done, and I'm going to wipe those away. Do some more good stuff. Do some more service. Oh, I saw that. Let me wipe 50 more away. And, he, and you keep on serving because you think that somehow, some way, God's going to wipe away the bad things you're doing and, and He's going to let you into heaven. That's a bad motivation. Not only is it bad, it's false. It's not true. You can never do enough good or acts of kindness or any kind of acts of mercy for God to take notice of that and wash away your sins. Our sin before God is like a filthy rag and all of our righteous deeds God will not accept. So those are all wrong reasons, but I want to share with you three God-given motivations that are in the Scriptures. I already mentioned one of them last Sunday, and it was so good that I want to mention it again, all right? Three God-given biblical motivations of serving the Lord. We should be motivated, number one, by gratitude, by gratitude. And I mentioned this, so I'm not going to go into all of, all of what I said last Sunday, but a few things to remind us of what, how this should motivate us. Let me read the Scripture for you. 1 Samuel 12, 24, it says, Only fear the Lord, okay, and serve Him in truth with all your heart. So only serve, don't serve anybody, don't serve, you're not serving anybody else. He's saying only fear the Lord and serve Him in truth with all your heart, okay? Tracking with me? Then he tells us why. For consider what great things He has done for you and me. Consider, consider. So we should serve the Lord 
considering the great things He has done for us. What is the greatest thing that God has done for you and for me? Well, you and I know that the greatest thing He has done is that He saved us. He hung on a cross for six hours and He died for our sins. And so He did that so that we would no longer live for ourselves, but live for Him who loved us and died for us. Let me ask you a question, a number of questions. Is there anything greater to you? Is there anything more valuable to you than knowing you are saved? Is there anything greater or more valuable to you than knowing you are saved? Than knowing that you get to enjoy the presence of God now and for all eternity? Is there anything greater to you? Well, for example, suppose God were to put $10 million into your bank account every morning for the rest of your life. Wow. But he did not save you. A lot of us love money, right? And that's really important. It's a drive in a lot of people's lives. Suppose God did all that. He gave you all that money, but he didn't save you. Value. What are you valuing? Suppose he gave you the most beautiful body and face of anyone in the world. And the body that would last, the beauty of your body would last for thousands of years. But at death, he shut you out of heaven and he cast you into the lake of fire. What good would that body do? What good would that face do? Jesus even says, what shall profit a man or a woman if they gain the whole world but lose their soul? It's true. Do you see uh, what has God ever given anyone that could compare with salvation he has given to us as believers? Nothing. And if you're struggling with that, you need to don't run out today. You need to grab me by the hand and say, Pastor, I need to talk. I'm struggling with this. Do you see that there's nothing God could ever do for you or give to you that is greater than the gift of himself? You see, when we get saved, when we experience salvation, the greatest gift of salvation is not so much that we go to heaven, but the gift is God himself. That's the gift. That's the gift that God has given to us. And if we... if Do you see that there's nothing ever that God can do for you that's greater than that? And then this, if we cannot be grateful servants of him who is everything and in whom we have everything, what in the world will ever make us grateful? I I submit to you that nothing, nothing will, nothing will. The greatest gift in the world, the greatest gift in the universe is God himself. And I pray you see it that way. And so gratitude for those things, ought to be a motivation to serve the Lord. But not only gratitude, I want to give you another challenge. Humility. Humility. We should serve the Lord in humility. Now, that's interesting. How can humility motivate us to serve the Lord? Well, we should all be striving for something, should we not? We should all be striving to be more and more like who? Jesus. We should be striving to be more like Jesus. And so as we serve the Lord and examine how he served us, guess what we find out? We find out that humility is a motivation that he wants us to follow. That's what he said. You've seen here, I've washed your feet, and you also ought to do the same thing. I've given this to you as an example that you should do as I have done. As I have done, as I have served you, you ought to do the same thing. And so with astonishing humility, Jesus, the Lord, the Master, He washes their feet as an example to all followers how they should serve with humility. And so we serve the Lord with humility. Guess why? Because it makes us more and more like Jesus. It makes us more and more like Jesus. Now, we have a competition here because the flesh operates against humility. The flesh promotes pride in our hearts and lives. And the Bible says that God resists the proud and he gives grace to the humble. The flesh is always going to operate against us being humble. And we we often find ourselves serving the Lord in ways that are not like the way Jesus served, do we not? But through the power of the Holy Spirit, we can reject the flesh and we can serve the Lord in humility, considering others better 
than ourself. As Paul says in Philippians chapter 2, verse 3, he says, Let nothing be done, nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Now, here's a question. Do you serve in humility? Now, if you answer that question in the affirmative, you just blew it, didn't you not? It's a tricky thing. I mean, I mean, we want to serve the Lord in humility. Have you ever heard that story of the guy who was struggling with, with being, pro, being proud? And he went to an old missionary friend of his, and he said, you know, I, I, you're the most humble person I know. Can you help me out? I want to, I want to be humble. What, did you, what, what can I do? He said, all right, this is what you do. I want you to get one of those sandwich signs. You put one on one side of the sign. You put uh, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. And on the other side of it, you say God loves God loves us, or something like that, right? You put it on, your, on there, and you walk around in downtown Boston during the noon hour, all back and forth and back and forth. By the end of the day, I guarantee you, you will be humble. It'll work. And so he does it all day long. He walks back and forth, and all day long, people are laughing at him, mocking at him, and he's just, his head is down, and he's like, man, this was tough. And so... He feels the humility, like, I've never been so humbled in my life. And when he gets home, he takes the sign off, he puts it over in the corner of the room, sits down in his lazy boy chair, he looks at the sign, and he goes, man, that was difficult. You know what? I can't think of anybody who would have done what I just did. You know what that means? You see how fast it'll, boom. As soon as you realize that you're humble, you just blew it. And so it's a tricky thing. But let me ask you some questions, and please don't answer out loud, it might embarrass you, Okay? Listen to this. So do you serve in humility? Think about this. Can you serve your boss and others at work, helping them to succeed and be happy, even when they are promoted and you are overlooked? Can you work to make others look good without envy filling your heart? Can you minister to the needs of those whom God exalts and men honor when you yourself are neglected? Can you pray for the ministry of others to prosper when it would cast yours in the shadows? Those are tough questions to think about, are they not? And I can guarantee you, if you're struggling with those things, you're not alone. We all struggle with those things. We want to, we don't want to be neglected. We don't want to be in the shadows. But that shows us that we're not serving the Lord. We are serving people. And we're serving people to get the praise of people, to be noticed by people. But the Lord wants us to serve Him. And as we serve Him, not really caring about what others are thinking of us, He's going to exalt us. If we humble ourselves in due time, the Scripture says that God will be the one who will exalt us. God will be the one who will promote us. And so we need to serve the Lord. Another example I can give you. In the Scriptures, and I'm not picking on you ladies, or if you're married, I'm not picking on you, but just I was talking about some friend, with, this, with some friends yesterday. In Ephesians chapter 5, it tells wives to be submissive to their husbands. Now, that's a <laughs> today's society, right? But that's the scriptures, and that's the true way God wants the wife to do. She wants the wife, he wants the wife to submit to her husband. Now, that's probably easy for a wife who has a godly husband who loves the Lord and is, and is living his life to glorify God. But if your husband's a jerk and you're told in the scriptures to submit to him, that's going to be a whole lot harder, is it not? Just shake your heads, nod your heads, and we'll get done quicker, okay? You know what I'm saying. And so if that husband is really not, you know, he's, he's difficult, unsaved, or just not promoting the things that you like to live for, whatever, it's hard. But what does Ephesians 5 say? Wives, submit to your husbands as unto the Lord. And so who are you really submitting to? You're living your life as a child of God, and you're living your life submitting unto the Lord. It just so happens that he, he happens to be the one you're submitting to, but you're really submitting to the Lord. If you live your life 
Live your life that you are serving the Lord in everything that you do, whether you're at a tough job and, and you're not being noticed. You're in a ministry and you're being neglected and your ministry is not prospering. You think I like seeing empty seats here? Drives me crazy. I serve the Lord in humility. I'm serving Him. Just so happens that you benefit from my service because I'm serving the Lord. And that goes in your work. That goes everywhere you go in your life. You serve the Lord. And so as we discipline ourselves to serve in, a, to serve in humility, it is a pathway for us to become more and more like Jesus, who says, while he was washing the disciples' feet, I've done this as an example that you should do as I have done. And so we serve because he left us an example of what true service is. And so he came not to serve us, but, to, but not to, for us to serve him, but for him to serve us. He gave his life as a ransom, the greatest act of humility. We ought to have the same mind, the mind of Christ Jesus. What else does he say about this? He says, if you serve this way, if you live your life this way, blessed are you. Happy are you. It's not going to be something that you're discouraged about. You're not going to feel guilty about doing it. You're not going to feel, oh, woe is me. You're going to be the happiest person in the world unless Jesus is telling you a lie. And I don't believe he lies. Blessed are you. If you know these things, blessed are you. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. If you do them. It's a wonderful motivation. The world will ask you, how many people serve you? That's what the world asks. The world will say, how many people are serving you? But the Lord will say it differently. The Lord will say, how many people are you serving? How many people are you serving? Because we serve the Lord. And so we need to discipline ourselves to serve the Lord. And our mor motivation to serve the Lord is gratitude. It is humility. And one more I want to share with you this morning, love. Love. Because love is the ultimate motivation for serving the Lord. It is the greatest motivation for serving the Lord. He, he loved us. He loved us and demonstrated His love for us by dying for our sins on the cross. And our love for Him demonstrates that we understand that love. And not only do we, not only do we see it as love Him loving us and us loving Him, but also God wants us to love people. He wants us to love people. It goes hand in hand. 1 John chapter 4, verse 20 and 21 says this. If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? Did you catch that? We say with our mouth that we love God, but yet we treat people like they're public enemy number one. God says you can't do that. you got to love the people you do see. That proves that you love the God you cannot see. You tracking with me? And this commandment we have from him, that he who loves God must love his brother also. And so love is the greatest motivation that God has given to us for serving him. There is nothing like love that motivates us longer and stronger than any other motivation. It'll motivate us longer and stronger. There are things, I guarantee, and you can relate to this, there are things that we do in our service to the Lord that you couldn't pay me enough to do. I wouldn't do it for money. There are certain things that we can do in this, our service to God that we, you just couldn't pay me to do it. I don't do it for that. I don't do it for money. I do it because I love the Lord. Amen? I'll give you an example. A missionary in Africa was asked, if they really liked what they were doing. His response was unexpected. Do I like this work? He says, no. This is a missionary. I don't like it. My wife and I do not like dirt. We don't like dirt. We, we have reasonably refined sensibilities. They're probably from England, all right? We do not like crawling this is why we are an English person would say something like that, right? We do not like crawling into vile huts through goat waste. But listen, and you can picture yourself doing that, right? No, you can't. But listen to what he says here. Is a person to do nothing for Christ he does not like? 
is a person to do nothing for Christ that he does not like? God pity him, if not. God pity him. Liking or disliking has nothing to do with it. Nothing to do with it. We have orders to go, and we go. Why do we go? Love. Love constrains us. Love compels us. Love for God makes, makes a duty, makes, I'm sorry, makes a delight out of duty. Love for God makes a delight out of duty. It lifts even the most mundane ministry, whether overseas, missions work, or service in the local church, out of the realm of repetitive responsibility. We serve the Lord. Now listen to this. I love this. Some may try to serve God without loving Him. That's true. People can serve God without even loving God, right? Some may try to serve God without loving Him, but listen to this. No one can love God without serving Him. No one can love God without serving Him. We can say we love Him. But the truth that we, re- we really love God is that we're serving Him. And so when the love of God has gotten a hold of your life and you understand God's love the way He wants you to understand it, the result is you no longer live for yourself, but you live for Him who loved you. Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 14 through 15, for the love of Christ compels us It constrains us. It motivates us. Because we judge thus, that if one died for all, Jesus, then all died. I died to myself. And he died for all. That those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. And so, the closer you get to the Lord, the more you love him. The closer you get to the Lord, the more you love Him. The more you love Him, the result will be that you will want to serve Him. You will want to serve Him. The more you serve the Lord, the more you will become like Him. Let me say that again. The closer you get to the Lord, the more you're going to love Him. The more you love Him, the result will be that you will want to serve Him. The more you serve Him, the more you will become like Him. That is how God works. And so we ought to serve the Lord. We need to be disciplined. We need to discipline ourselves to serve Him with the right motivation, gratitude, humility, and love. These are all healthy, biblical motivations, reasons for us to serve the Lord who delivered us from darkness into His marvelous light. Now, as you sit here this morning, I'm sure in your heart, if the Spirit of God is living in you, you say, yeah, I agree with everything Pastor said this morning. And um, as you said, yeah, I don't know you. I don't know what everybody does, right? But I know that if what I just said to you right now, if God's Spirit is in you, you say, you're saying to yourself, I want to serve the Lord. If you're truly a child of God, you want to serve the Lord. And maybe you're wondering, I, I don't know what to do. I don't know how to serve the Lord. I don't know um, what, he's, what abilities He's given to me. Well, let me encourage you with these closing remarks here that listen. When you got saved, God gave you the gift of the Holy Spirit. You have the Holy Spirit living in you. With the gift of the Holy Spirit comes spiritual gifts or spiritual abilities that He's given to every believer. Some, some, some have one spiritual gift. Some have many spiritual gifts. We shouldn't be envious of those who have more than us. But every believer has a spiritual ability uh, the ability that God has given to you to serve in some kind of capacity. Now, I don't know what it is for you. I know wh- how God's gifted me. But I guarantee, I promise you that God has given you a spiritual gift to serve Him. And over and over again, the Scriptures tell us that the spiritual gifts are not given just for us to hold on to. But the spiritual gifts are given to us, regardless of what that spiritual gift is. And we're going to look at that when we get to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. But whatever that spiritual gift that God has given to you, He's given it to you for you to use it, for you to serve. And so don't sit around and wait to try to figure out, to think through it all. Just start serving. Just start serving. 
Find something to do. We have so many things that you can do here at Calvary. There's, there's a cleaning ministry. There's a cleaning ministry. You don't even have to have a spiritual gift for that, right? You just got to have a desire to, to be comp- helpful and just start helping clean. There's, there's needs in the nursery, working with the children. You got to have compassion to do that as well. And, and there's, there's Sunday school help. We need to develop an a, a usher's ministry where men who are called to lead in the church and help they can be trained to be an usher, and it also provides security for, as a church, that we need to be secure and keep an eye on danger that could be coming our way. We need to have ushers that can be watching that before it happens. We need volunteers to go and visit people. There's people that can't make it to church, and they, God wants you to go visit them. And so all of these things do, some of them require spiritual gifts. Some of them don't. But we need, all of us need to say, Lord, how have you gifted me? What can I do? And don't just wait. Don't wait for a lightning bolt to hit you. Volunteer. Serve. Serve the Lord. Jesus says in John 13, 17, if you know these things, blessed, happy are you if you do them. If you want to be truly happy in life, find satisfaction, find contentment. Know what God's purpose for your life is. What is it? It's to serve Him. So as I end this morning, my question to you, and to me as well, is how are you serving the Lord? In what capacity, in what way are you serving the Lord? Now as I close in prayer this morning, in the bulletin, there is a tear-off card. Okay? This morning... And every morning I want to do this is if God has spoken to your heart and you want to respond to the message, you don't have to come forward during the song, but you can fill out this little card, a desire of of what your next step is. You know Christ. You want to grow in Christ. You want to be discipled. You want to be baptized. You want to show Christ. There's a a way of you serving the Lord. How are you serving the Lord? There's so many ways to serve the Lord. If you're not serving the Lord and you feel today, you know what? I need to serve. And there's even one here. I want to serve where needed. If you're not serving the Lord and you want to begin doing that, you'll find out pretty quickly if you're gifted in that area. The person you're serving with is going to tell you, hey, (laughs) you should find something else, you know? But whatever, you know what? They might be doing it in a nice way. It's okay. Maybe, you know, some people don't have the gift of teaching, but they like to talk. They shouldn't be teaching. And the people who are listening to them will let them know, you know what, you should find something else to do. Whatever. That's just an example. But this morning, if God has worked in your heart, use this little tear-off card. You tear it off like this. You write your name and information on it. Fill it out. Put it in the offering plate when it comes by later. I like to close in a word of prayer. And after I pray... Michaela is going to lead us in a closing song, a a song of response. It's a song for us to respond to God and what he's called us to do. You don't have to come forward during the song. You can if you want and come down here and pray. But where you're sitting, you can respond to what God has said to you this morning and fill out that card and put it in the offering plate when it comes by. All right? Let's pray. Father, as we close this message and as we think about... um, the need that we have, the motivations that we ought to feel in serving you and desiring to serve you. Lord, I pray everyone here who, who knows you as their Lord and Savior that they are fulfilling the calling that you placed upon them to serve you in some capacity. Lord, that you know it and I know it, that if everyone's doing their part, we'll be a healthy church and we will grow. We'll grow in health, and we will also grow in numbers. And so I pray that every believer here will know their part in the body of Christ, and they will commit to serve you in the body, to glorify you. And I pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. So why don't we stand? Let's sing this invitational song, song of response.
Jesus, you are the reason. Uh, you're the reason that uh, we live. And I thank you for the joy, the grace that you give 